Deus Ex is bafflingly good. It might not seem like it today, if you've never played this 22-year-old game, a product that's now old enough to get a job, use the paycheck from that job to buy a pack of smokes, and then light them up at a bar down the street while having an ice-cold beer, that it might not seem like much. Just another PC shooter slash stealth game from the early 2000s, but it's so much more than that. Deus Ex was a pioneer of incredible design, levels that are interconnected with multiple paths and methods of approach, a game that truly puts freedom into the player's hands. Every obstacle requires something different, but the list of requirements are miles long, and it's up to you to choose how you want to go about this. A genuinely free game, something that feels so non-linear while also telling an incredibly linear story. The game would go on to inspire gamers and developers for ages. Deus Ex is a game that people still talk about to this day, one that I am currently talking about right now. It has an incredible lasting legacy, fantastic gameplay, and a scarily prophetic story. Speaking of story, the tale that Deus Ex weaves is one filled with intrigue, conspiracy, and style. It has everything from government domination, augmented super soldiers, shady men working behind the scenes, corrupt and helpful AI, terrorist organizations, and a journey that takes you all around the world. The story and world for the game was so complex that the developers themselves posted their game design document online just so that people could get more answers. The world itself is beautiful, incredibly simple, but also oozing with that style that you really expect from a game in its era. The soundtrack thumps in the right places and sits back when it knows it's time. This all comes together to form the aesthetic that is Deus Ex. You see, there's a certain feeling that you get when playing this game. It's a feeling that's almost indescribable. A lot of games have given me this feeling in the past, it's one that you know when you see it. I'll be honest though, I've had trouble putting this feeling into words. I usually describe it as comfy or soul, but I'm going to challenge myself today. That's what I want to talk about in this video, how Deus Ex makes me feel. We'll talk about gameplay, mechanics, story, and everything in between. If you enjoyed the video and want to support the channel, you can do so for free by liking the video and subscribing. You can also support the channel on Patreon, where I upload longer versions of my full retrospectives and rambling text post updates. You can also follow me on Twitch, where I play games that I'm not currently reviewing. Spoilers for everything Deus Ex ahead. Hey Dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I want to talk about Deus Ex. Hey dad, before we get into the video, I'd like to talk about today's sponsor, Figurama. Specifically, I'd like to take a look at their new Silent Hill 2 statue. I'm super into figures, and I probably already spend way too much money on them, but this piece is just gorgeous. It's the very first versus piece available for Silent Hill 2. There's five total characters represented in the statue, Red Pyramid Thing, James Sunderland, and three monsters, Abstract Daddy, Flesh Lip, and Lying Figure. Another first for Figurama, James can be taken out of his display and swapped out with a TV to make the statue into a solo piece. If you're a fan of the original Silent Hill 2, which this statue is based on, not the remake, then you have to get this thing. It's also worth noting that these statues usually double in price after they sell out, so you're going to want to get one fast. To that end, you can use my code to get $35 off of your pre-order. Pre-orders go live February 11th at 11 p.m. JST, but you can join the waitlist now with the link in the description to be reminded when it goes live. Make sure to snag yours and use my coupon code YFSH2 to get $35 off your pre-order of this amazing figure. Now, back to the video, Dad. Deus Ex began development in 1997. John Romero, who was still running Ion Storm at that time, had approached Warren Spector and told him to develop the game of his dreams. 
Spectre had worked as an editor at Space Gamer magazine and eventually went on to work on quite a few tabletop role-playing games, which actually has a lot more to do with Deus Ex's development than you think. He worked on GURPS, Top Secret, and Marvel Super Heroes. He eventually entered the video game industry by joining Origin, who had made games like Ultima 3 Exodus, Ultima 4 Quest of the Avatar, Ultima 5 Warriors of Destiny, and Ogre. Spectre would go on to produce Ultima 6, Wing Commander, and many other games at Origin. He bounced around a bit and was supposed to work on a game with EA when he got this massive offer from John Romero to join Ion Storm. At the time, Spectre had already wanted to make a game called Troubleshooter. It was supposed to be set in the real world and be a massive big budget action shooter. This was the game that would later become Deus Ex. Spectre's idea was to make a world where conspiracies had become reality. Set in the future of the 2050s, governments had run rampant and exerted incredible control over the populaces of the world. Spectre was a very specific and picky overlord for this development. He had tons of commandments that the team had to follow and could not break. His specific ideas didn't just extend to story, though. They also permeated the realm of gameplay. Spectre was frustrated at the time by multiple genres. He was angry at shooters because he died so much, he was angry at stealth games because they didn't let him fight, and he was angry at role-playing games because they were all set in the same boring fantasy landscape. He wanted to break these conventions and create something that combined all of these genres into one. Not only that, but he wanted the player to choose which of the genres they would play throughout the game. Spectre wanted to give the players agency for the gameplay, allowing them to choose how they approached situations, but the narrative was to stay linear. Spectre describes the narrative of Deus Ex as what you are doing and the why you are doing it, but not the how you are doing it. This was reserved for the gameplay. Spectre himself describes this as the pleasure of creativity or unique experiences. The list of inspirations that the team took to develop their aesthetic and story was miles long. Games like Half-Life, Fallout, Thief, Goldeneye, movies like Colossus, The Forbin Project, The Manchurian Candidate, Robocop, Blade Runner, and even shows like X-Files were responsible for the developers setting their sights on conspiracies. I do have to give a ton of credit to Warren Spector here. Watching and reading through tons of interviews with him, he seems like a guy that's genuinely wanted to make the game of his dreams, and he's incredibly grateful that he got to do that. He also seems humble, someone that is able to recognize that the players and their interpretations of the games are just as big of a part of making the game what it is as the team itself. I feel like I have to point this out sometimes when I'm talking about older games. We have a modern landscape where developers, at least larger ones, tend to have an attitude of, I know better than you. So it can be genuinely refreshing to look at this old crop of devs who just seemed excited to make the games that they enjoyed. Spectre's dream grew into a reality though. It may have taken a bit longer than planned. The game's scope grew as the production went on, and they also ran into some management structure issues. But nonetheless, Deus Ex was released for Microsoft Windows on June 23rd, 2000. Before we get into things, I'd like to talk about the edition of Deus Ex that I played. Deus Ex was originally released on Windows, but the Game of the Year edition was released almost a year later on May 8th, 2001. It was a slightly updated version of the game with the most recent patch and a very short list of updates to the maps. These changes mostly include moving items or grates into specific spots, but overall very little difference. There was also a version of Deus Ex released on the PlayStation 2 called Deus Ex The Conspiracy. This version of the game is very different, smaller sectioned maps, layout changes, lower resolution textures, but higher resolution character models. The game's biggest difference though lies in its intro and ending cutscenes, which are pre-rendered compared to the original in-game cutscenes. Overall, I chose the Game of the Year version of this game. This is mostly because it's the only one that's distributed on storefronts today. This came with its own set of problems though, because on modern hardware, this game can be pretty broken. 
I had to install tons of different fan patches to get the game to work properly, and even then I still got tons of bugs throughout my playthrough. One persistent issue was the game going to a black screen randomly, forcing me to restart. It was something I had to deal with, but it's a shame that games like this don't get the preservation that they deserve, especially considering what a masterpiece this is. I should also mention that some of these mods include one that upgraded the visuals of Deus Ex slightly. This just really improves lighting and some models, but sometimes it had the opposite effect with the lights throbbing at certain points throughout the playthrough. Deus Ex actually begins with a training mission. This tutorial takes us through most parts of the combat and gameplay systems, using weapons, hiding bodies, healing, stealth. I'll get into gameplay a bit more in depth once we get there, but this tutorial section is entirely optional. It provides a really good base for Deus Ex's systems. I do think that the better tutorial area is actually the first mission of the game itself, which acts as a proving ground. Before we get to that mission, we actually get to create our character. Well, technically speaking, we do. But this isn't the traditional role-playing character creation. We don't get a blank slate and get to do whatever we want. Our character's name will always be J.C. Denton, but we can pick his real name, which will be mentioned a few times in emails and notes. This is important to note, because like we talked about before, Deus Ex doesn't give you full freedom with its narrative. It isn't a role-playing game per se, it's a mishmash of multiple genres. Every other area is where this game truly lets you roam free. The important choice we get to make here is skills. This is our leveling system for the game. We get skill points by completing objectives, and we can use these to upgrade our skill levels in multiple categories. Some of these, like swimming and environmental training, can be pretty useless, as there are items in the game that will let us swim without a higher skill level. Computer, electronics, lock picking, and all the weapon skills are pretty important, though. Each skill has four levels and generally determines how proficient you are with a weapon, or how fast you can complete a task. We get an intro scene here. Two characters are having a conversation. Two men who we don't know yet, but seem to be controlling some very high-level matters. This small scene sets the tone for the world of Deus Ex. The year is 2052, and a plague is running rampant across the United States. The Grey Death is killing tons of people, and the only cure is something called Ambrosia. These two men seem to want this virus to run rampant, to kill as many people as possible. The general story is, though, that the cure is being stolen by terrorist forces, like the NSF, to hoard it all for themselves, which is why the populace can't get any. But as we see from this conversation, this really isn't the case. We start our first mission on Liberty Island in New York. We play as J.C. Denton, a new recruit to UNATCO, the United Nations Anti-Terrorist Coalition. In the world of Deus Ex, mechanical augmentations for soldiers have been a thing for a while. These augmentations give soldiers superhuman abilities, but now JC is one of two soldiers that have nano augmentations. These nanites give soldiers even more powers than mechanics ever could. Seeing in the dark, going unseen from the human eye, shirking off damage from bullets. The only other soldier to have these augmentations is JC's brother, Paul Denton. We meet Paul on the pier. He tells us about our first mission. The NSF have stolen a shipment of Ambrosia and are trapped inside the Statue of Liberty, which has already been hit by terrorist attacks before this. The NSF are the National Secessionist Forces. To give a bit of backstory to the world, back in 2030, over 20 years before the game begins, AIDS was running rampant in the US. The same year that it was cured, a massive earthquake hit the southwestern coast of the country. This caused most of Southern California to be destroyed. After this, the US fell into turmoil, both financial and physical. A lot of states started to secede and formed their own secessionist force. As we begin the game, we are working against these forces. UNATCO was formed to stop terrorist threats like these. I would like to note here that a lot of the lore information that I'm going to be talking about isn't explicitly stated through cutscenes in the game. Some of this information comes from the myriad of lore books that we can find throughout our adventure, and a lot of it comes from something called the Deus Ex Bible. This was an incredibly interesting piece of information that was posted by the developers on GameSpy in 2002. 
It was effectively their game design document and acts as a huge lore dump. Tons of information on the state of the world, the history, more background information on characters. It was so much of a definitive statement on the world of the game that developers of future entries in the series would use it as a sacred text to make sure they got the details right going in. Paul gives us a choice of a weapon here, a rifle, gep gun, or a crossbow. On my first playthrough, I picked the crossbow, thinking this would be the best option for stealth, and boy was I wrong. Before we get into the intricacies of weapons, we should probably talk about how Deus Ex actually plays. This is exactly what we're introduced to when we start Liberty Island. While I don't think Liberty Island is the most perfect level in this game, I do think that it is the perfect starting level for this game. As we talked about in the development section, Deus Ex was meant to give players the agency to approach gameplay situations as they please. Whether you want to run and gun, blast your way into the buildings, or sneak around and take out enemies undetected, even talk to other characters to find hidden passageways or extra secrets, it's entirely up to you. And once you enter on one path, you aren't restricted from changing to another. This is exactly what Deus Ex does. It gives you the true freedom to decide what you want the game to be. It does it in the most pure and genuine sense imaginable as well. Today, we've seen this before. It's not anything new. But Deus Ex was one of the progenitors of the immersive sim genre. If you aren't sure what an immersive sim is, that's fine, because people that like immersive sims aren't really even sure what an immersive sim is either. Generally, the genre can be described as putting player choice at the forefront, allowing the player to use creative methods to approach different situations. The genre also has some other staples, like being able to pick up random items that seemingly have no use. They also generally have interconnected maps and have a pretty open level design. Some staples of the genre are Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, which heavily leans more into the role-playing aspect of the genre, Thief, System Shock, and Deus Ex itself. But the genre is really so vague that some people lump the Elder Scrolls games in here, Bioshock, and even Pathologic. All great games, but whether they're immersive sims or not is debatable. It's actually a never-ending conversation. But one thing we can be certain of is that Deus Ex is an immersive sim. It actually pioneered the genre, and back in the year 2000, this was massively revolutionary. Deus Ex isn't just impressive or interesting for the year 2000 though, it's impressive today as well. In my mind, there are sort of two approaches to any situation in Deus Ex, stealth and attack. Stealth requires you to slip through the shadows, find hidden grates in the walls to traverse through, hack computer systems to turn off cameras and turrets, lockpick doors and take out enemies from behind. Not being seen is paramount if you're trying to stealth, then getting seen is the real enemy. Once this happens, the alarms start blaring, you're caught and you have to retreat back into the darkness. The other approach, attack, is much more loud. This sees you using explosives to blow up doors that are in your way, attacking enemies head-on, blowing up machines, and using augmentations to run past turrets. These are the two clear ways to approach, but the game isn't exactly that 50-50. That's exactly where the genius lies. Warren Spector describes the story of Deus Ex as a character that sees the world as black and white, realizing that there's so much more gray than he ever understood. This doesn't just describe the story, it describes the gameplay of Deus Ex itself and the journey of the player throughout the course of the game. In real life, we are J.C. Denton, seeing two potential paths throughout the game and realizing there is way more fun to be had here than we even understand. We can turn turrets on enemies to take them out for us. We can rush through a level, scrambling equipment and running right past it. One of the later levels allows you to traverse over top of a base, skipping entire areas. These aren't exploits, they're part of the game. The team themselves have stated that players had to teach them how to play the game, and this is what it's all about, finding new solutions to the problems that the game presents you with. Spectre also talks a lot about the way he views games against other media like film or books. He says that other media gives you statements, 
This is the way things are. Games ask you questions and let you answer them. Deus Ex's gameplay lets you answer as many questions as you want, maybe like no other game ever has. We can use a variety of different weapons in Deus Ex, a regular pistol, a stealth pistol to go in quiet, an assault rifle, shotguns, a sniper rifle, a gep gun that blasts enemies away. Most of these weapons can be modified to increase their range, accuracy, and recoil. I personally used a sniper rifle for most of the second half of the game with a suppressor on it. It was deadly accurate, highly damaging, and mostly quiet. We can use EMP grenades to take out enemy equipment, we can use lambs to blow up doors, enemies themselves, or massive robots. Taking out enemies quietly can be done by whacking them with a baton from behind, but if they notice us, we can shock them and quickly run around their back to take them out before they hit us. On top of that, there are a ton of augmentations in the game exclusive to JC and his brother. We get these gradually over the course of the story. We usually get to choose between two, and then upgrade those along the way. These can range from a cloaking device that enables us to go unseen, a device that heals us incredibly quickly, one that lets us see in the dark. These are all powered by bioelectric energy, which we have to keep an eye on. This meter can be refilled with biocells, just like health, but it can drain pretty fast depending on which AUG we're using. I've played a lot of narrative choice games before, games like Mass Effect, Dragon Age, or Fable, games where the story is shaped by the choices that you make along the way. That can usually feel pretty free, but it generally feels like there's a veil somewhere. There's a thin curtain, and you know as soon as you pull it back, the illusion will be gone. You've found out the trick. Deus Ex is different. You're given freedom with gameplay, not narrative. There are some narrative choices that we can make along the way here, but they're generally pretty limited. Deus Ex gives you the keys to the kingdom from the very beginning, though. No longer are we constrained to long corridor dungeons with one or two branching paths and an extra chest off to the side. It almost feels like we have a whole world to experience here, and we're allowed to do it however we please. This can seem almost overwhelming at first, like, what am I supposed to do with all these tools? You've given me too much choice. Return me to the padded room. I'd like a straight and narrow corridor, please. But eventually, it just clicks. There's a moment where you just understand it. You understand the freedom of approach and the value of that. I will say that I've never really been a big fan of stealth, and I've only played a handful of immersive sims. Usually in stealth games I choose to run and gun, but I wanted to challenge myself with Deus Ex. I wanted to try and stealth as much as I could. I did stealth for quite a bit of Deus Ex, but I quickly realized that it wasn't about stealth or not stealth. It's about doing whatever the fuck you want. That's why the game is so great, because it's yours, not someone else's. In that freedom is paradise. This freedom is nowhere better showcased than in the first level. Here we have a single goal, to invade the terrorist group that's holed up in the Statue of Liberty. We can go through the main gate that's guarded by a powerful robot, we can go around back and sneak inside by climbing on some boxes, we can talk to Harley Philbin at the North Docks to get a key for the doors. There are a lot of ways to go about this situation, and the level itself isn't the best in the game. It's kind of small, there's not a ton going on here, and it isn't the most visually interesting outside of the decapitated Statue of Liberty, which clearly sets the tone and theme for the game with a massive visual metaphor. But if you think of this level as unreal, as a sort of tryout for the real thing, then I think it really works. This is the moment to figure things out, to test the boundaries of the simulation that we found ourselves in. Each mission usually has some optional objectives that we can complete as well. These give us skill points, but could also affect later missions, affect the mission we're currently in, or give us better weapons and ammo. I took the optional objective to rescue Gunther, another UNATCO agent that had been captured by NSF forces. Once we get to the top of the statue, we find the terrorist leader and realize that the Ambrosia has already left. He thinks the government made the plague on purpose for population control. He throws some statistics our way to try and convince us that things aren't as cut and dry as they seem. Number one, 
1945, corporations paid 50% of federal taxes. Now they pay about 5%. Number two, in 1900, 90% of Americans were self-employed. Now it's about 2%. So? It's called consolidation. Strengthen governments and corporations, weaken individuals. This is the first indication that the game gives us that the NSF might not be what they've been made out to be. He also cites things like the Trilateral Commission, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds. One of the best things about Deus Ex's writing is that it bases its current political climate off of real-world conspiracy theories from the 90s. This makes the situation feel way more genuine. We're not talking about random people here, new characters in a fictional world. This is our world in the future. It creates a way more genuine world than if the team had just created real-life allegories. One of Deus Ex's huge strengths, a large reason that it still holds up today, is because people consider it to be quite prophetic. A game that was released in 2000 talking about the future 50 years later has a world racked by viruses, terrorism, conspiracy, government surveillance, and a lack of online privacy, even down to the New York skyline not having the Twin Towers. Now, of course, these were all things that had been talked about for quite some time. The developers aren't exactly Nostradamus, but it really hits home and is one of the reasons that Deus Ex still works, especially post-2020. I also have to say, personally, I was a huge conspiracy goblin in middle school. A perhaps too early obsession with the X-Files created a teen that knew the truth was out there. I perused the internet quite often in the search for this holy grail of truth, whether in the form of aliens, government corruption, or anything sinister. Looking back on it now, it was mostly a form of entertainment for me. At the time, everything I saw online was an extension of the X-Files. These were just larger mysteries of fiction that were based around real-world events. I think that's how a lot of people used to enjoy conspiracy, at least from my perspective. That isn't to say there haven't always been people who take things too far. I just think it was far less common then. Also, don't misconstrue my points here, I always suggest a healthy mistrust of your government, but it's clear that today, conspiracy theory can no longer be enjoyed as a form of entertainment. It's become far too real for most people, and the art of the conspiracy theory has mostly been lost to time, mangled into something that I don't really recognize anymore. It's a far cry from watching videos of UFOs and trying to find documentation about Roswell on the internet in 2005. Deus Ex and things like it resurrect that for me. That interest, that intrigue, that feeling that something sinister is going on and you're going to find out what it is, but in a fictional world. It's almost like a mix between a government noir story and a massive spy thriller. The NSF terrorist leader is taken in and JC is ordered to report back to the UNATCO headquarters, which happens to be right next to the Statue of Liberty. Manderly, the head of UNATCO, wants to brief us on our next mission. We can read tons of emails and books in the headquarters that further contextualize the world around Deus Ex. These memos usually give some sort of background on a character or the current political state. These are mostly supplementary, not necessary, but furthering the knowledge of the Deus Ex world will only further your experience of the game itself. We can talk to Anna Navarre and Gunther Herman, two fellow UNATCO agents. We can also go into the woman's restroom, which is a big no-no. Manderly will even scold us for it later, which I thought was hilarious. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. By the way, Dutton, stay out of the ladies' restroom. That kind of activity embarrasses the agency more than it does you. Our real goal is to talk to Jaime Reyes, the UNATCO doctor, and Alex Jacobson, the communications engineer. Alex is the one that mostly gives us orders in the field and helps out with our objectives. We can also talk to Sam Carter, who will give us some equipment for our next mission. Once we talk to Manderley and get our next mission, we have to go after the NSF's stolen ambrosia. JC's job is to knock out a generator so that Paul can get in and take out the terrorist forces. We head with Anna first and have to infiltrate a castle where a store of ambrosia is being held. Once we find the ambrosia, we can head over to the subway and save some hostages. 
We finally meet Paul in Hell's Kitchen, and this is where the game starts to open up a bit. Deus Ex will never rival the mass open worlds we have today, sprawling cities or full-to-the-brim taverns in RPGs, but it does have something that those games don't. Style. This aspect is something I've always struggled to explain in games. The games that have this sense of aesthetic and design are few and far between. Before, I've described this as soul or comfy. They're games that make you feel like you're at home. You feel like you're at rest. You aren't working against a system. You're having fun. But it's not easy to put this into words. What makes a game feel like it has a mortal core that gives life to sentient beings? What makes a game make you feel good? In Jesse Shell's The Art of Game Design, he states that to take the risk of immersing yourself in a fantasy world, we like to be in a safe place, either alone or surrounded by the people we know and trust. He likens this liminal reality that the experience of a game takes place in as a hearth. In his context, Shell is referring more to communal aspects of games, playing the Wii with your family when you're young, for example. But I think this hearth is nonetheless a poignant metaphor. It can be difficult for a game to make you relax, and it's not even always necessary. Some games want to make you scared, some want you to feel tense, and trust me, there are tense moments in Deus Ex. When you're following a guard down a hallway, ready to take them out with your baton, hoping that they don't turn around at the last second, and then they do. You kill them, but the facility alarms are blaring, screeching in your ears. You have to make a quick decision to hide or to fight. It's true anxiety in the moment. But overall, the general design of Deus Ex makes us feel at home. It makes us feel a part of something larger. It makes you feel relaxed. You can almost feel the glow of your parents' monitor on your face as you sit up late, way past your bedtime, the volume turned down on the speakers, telling yourself just one more mission. Don't confuse this feeling for nostalgia, either. I've never played Deus Ex as a kid, but everything that this game does is put together in a package that makes you feel like you've just arrived, after a long journey, and it's finally time to take some rest. I think that a large part of this game's feel is its OST. It's a masterpiece of sound. It's somehow both hard-hitting and wistful at the same time. The action themes, like the one on Liberty Island, is heavy, grandiose, with a feeling of patriotism permeating the background. Tracks like the Battery Park action theme are upbeat and bouncy. A myriad of interesting synths and instruments plot this whole track. Each area even has its own death theme, which is just impressive in and of itself. Offering a new track each time you die in an area is just wild. There's also something to be said about the main title theme, which just represents the story and adventure we're about to go on. It's massive, a wide scope, trying to at once convey subterfuge and conspiracy, while also pushing through themes of adversity and freedom on top of it. There is one song on the OST that's my favorite, though, the credits theme, or as it's titled on the official release, The Illuminati.
this song just goes hard. It rips through with hard riffs and open synths. Throughout the track, it evolves into something else that feels seedy, underground, like hiding after a win. The whole soundtrack is terrific. It perfectly reflects the game itself and is a massive part of why playing this game feels so good in the first place. I haven't stopped playing these songs since I beat the game. Once we get into Hell's Kitchen, we can head to the Underworld Tavern. Here we can talk to some people, learn about a local thug named Jojo, get some information on the NSF generator, and talk to an interesting man named Jock. Jock used to be a military test pilot and has a ton of his own theories about what the government has going on at Area 51. We can go to a nearby hotel and stop a hostage situation that's plaguing the owner, Mr. Renton. We can then visit Paul's apartment, where he's left us some nice equipment in a hidden room behind a false bookcase. It should be noted here that we can see signs of distress in Paul's room, both in the environment design but also the things he's reading. This tells us that his character probably isn't handling his new augmentations too well, or possibly something deeper. Deus Ex does this a lot, telling its story through its environment. We can also visit the smuggler in his hideout who will sell us some items. He wanted me to save his friend, so I did that. We have to head to the rooftops and make our way to that generator eventually, though. We can start taking out troops, and this is where my addiction to the sniper rifle began. Once we destroy the generator, Jack takes us out of there in a black helicopter. He'll be our signature pilot from here on out. Back at the office, we have to see Manderley, but we can eavesdrop on his conversation with Walton Simmons. Just fire the arrogant son of a bitch. I wasn't exaggerating. He's our best agent. We don't need him. We've got his brother, and more are on the way. He knows nothing. I think he does. You should never have sent him to Hong Kong. Let's be sensible. We have to look at the whole record. Walton Simmons happens to be the director of FEMA and is pretty high up in the hierarchy of control. Manderley tells us Paul went offline, and it seems like he might have defected. We have to take his spot and get the Ambrosia back from the terrorists. There's an interesting little extra scene that we can get here with Walton Simmons. When he walks away, he says that he's going to interrogate some terrorists. We can head downstairs to see him doing this. He's not exactly being nice, and eventually he shoots both of them. Before we leave on the next mission, we see some MIB agents outside of the headquarters. Squeeze on Manderley about this one. Get on the helicopter, Mr. Denton. Simons did not appreciate your interference. We're dropped off in the subway and meet Harley Philbin, who lets us down into a secret phone booth entrance that takes us into the subway. We have to get acquainted with the mole people, who are homeless that live in the underground tunnels of the city. This is a real term that references a real phenomena. People have been known to live in the abandoned parts of the New York City subway stations, most notably covered in the documentary Dark Days. Taking these mole people tunnels, we eventually reach an NSF helibase. We recover most of the ambrosia and are supposed to track down a man named Juan Lebedev, who is funding the NSF. When we find Paul, though, we realize what the director said was right. Paul is a part of the NSF. He's defected. He thinks that the Grey Death was man-made, and the government is controlling the cure. The NSF can use Ambrosia to make more of a cure. He wanted me to hear out Lebedev, but when I found him, Anna was already there. She was going to kill him, even though that was against UNATCO rules. Our goal is to kill Lebedev, but we don't actually have to do that. We can kill Lebedev, kill Anna, or kill both of them. I chose to save Lebedev. Alex wasn't too happy about this, but he figured I had my own reasons. This choice won't wildly affect the game overall, but it will affect conversations moving forward. It's not that we get to choose the narrative here, it's just that the system allows us the freedom to do what we want, and that includes killing NPCs sometimes. We talk to Gunther after this, who thinks Anna might be in trouble, but we just lie our way out. The Coalition is completely against Paul at this point, he is now the enemy. Back at UNATCO, Manderley suspects us of killing Navarre, or at least covering up for Paul. Apparently, they've activated Paul's kill switch, a back door that was built into his augmentations. Both of our augmentations. Luckily, they take some time to have an effect. Now we have to head to Hong Kong to track down Paul. 
Before we get there, we meet Paul in his apartment. He's too injured to leave, and he wants us to send out an NSF beacon. He tells us we'll get proof of the NSF's innocence at their headquarters. Once we send out the beacon, there's no turning back, and we're the enemy of UNATCO. Every UNATCO agent starts attacking us, and we have to escape. When we head back to Paul, he tells us that Simmons is actually part of an organization called Majestic 12. They've been using FEMA to try and shut down the U.S. government. MIB agents then invade the room. These guys are pretty strong, and they explode when they die. We can fight them and try to save Paul or just leave him, but either way, it's a scripted death because we get knocked out and wake up in an unknown location, captured. Someone called Daedalus contacts us and helps us escape. We have to make our way through the Majestic 12 base, using the vents to get around. We'll encounter multiple creatures that are being either synthesized or examined here. Lizard people and massive beasts we can unleash on the MJ-12 agents. Turns out this entire place is underneath the UNATCO headquarters, and we have to get out. We can convince some of the UNATCO people to leave the organization. We find out that MJ-12 actually took control away from the previous ruling cabal, the Illuminati. Bob Page is now the one controlling everything. Now that I wasn't a part of UNATCO, I could go into the women's restroom all I wanted. Sweet. When we find Manderly, he's in big trouble with Simmons over everything that's happened. I decided to kill him. I escaped and Jock was on my side, so he was going to take me to Hong Kong. We get stopped for a quick detour at an MJ-12 base and have to escape there as well. Hong Kong is a great area. The whole design and aesthetic is one of the best areas in the game. Unfortunately, though, it's where the story starts to drag a little bit. It's not a huge downgrade, it's just this middle-of-the-game lull that isn't the best. I do think the area itself is fantastic, though. The change of scenery and aesthetic is very welcome and provides a fresh new design for us to look at for a while. Our overall goal here is to find Tracer Tong, because he might be able to help us disable both JC and Paul's kill switches. Before we do this, though, we have to get involved in some triad disputes. We have to make peace between two factions so that we can find Tracer himself. We also get a pretty damn good melee weapon in the process called the Dragon's Tooth Sword. This thing kills most everything in one hit and is a perfect weapon to use for just about the rest of the game. We eventually meet Tong, who turns off our kill switch. Paul is on his way to Hong Kong, but we have to finish dealing with the triad dispute. We have to sneak into VersaLife to find the ROM encoding for the sword. We sneak into the facility that we saw from the beginning of the game. The veritable sword of Damocles hanging over the earth just happens to be in the shape of a hand. I think it's worth noting the situation here. Now that we've separated from UNATCO, become an enemy of the state and cabal, and are full-on working towards some sort of freedom or peace, there's something to be said about how playing the game reflects this freedom. With player agency and choice of approach put at the forefront, you can't stop thinking about the fact that this mirrors the story itself. A man who thinks in black and white, J.C. Denton, but also you, the player, is introduced to a world of moral grays. This is, again, both J.C. Denton being introduced to the upending of his own world and what he thought was right and wrong, and you, the player, being introduced to the freedom of approaching situations, not just by blowing up enemies head-on or sneaking around and stealing, but maybe some strange new combination of those things. In this facility, we can find some more of Majestic 12's experiments, like a full-on gray alien dead on a table. We have to make a quick escape from the labs and we solve the dispute between the triads. Tong wants us to head back into the facility, though, so that we can find out how they manufacture the virus. We head through a back entrance and end up destroying MJ-12's machine that manufactures the Gray Death. Tong then tells us about the Illuminati. They were the organization that was in control before MJ-12. They consider themselves more benevolent rulers than the ones that followed. Our job is now to seek out Morgan Everett, one of the Illuminati heads in Paris. Before we leave, we meet up with Paul, who's also had his kill switch turned off. It's also not certain that Paul even appears at this point in the game. The same with any of the killable characters from before. If he died back in Hell's Kitchen, then he just won't be here. It doesn't affect the story a ton, it's just worth noting that these optional conversations will be gone. We head to New York and meet with Stanton Dowd, another member of the Council of Five, the previous ruling faction. 
He directs us to the Brooklyn Naval Shipyard, where he thinks Majestic 12 is storing the virus. Here, we can either meet harsh resistance or some helpful soldiers that will let us in. If we talk to one of the Navy men back in Hell's Kitchen, he'll tell us that he wants to know what the government has been doing at their shipyard. This causes him to let some of his men know ahead of time that we're coming and they let us through. These little options are always a great addition to the game. They're not mandatory and there's really no way we'd know about them if we didn't go out of our way to chat with people and explore. But that's the point. Deus Ex hides all of its little secrets from you in an effort to push you out of your comfort zone. It wants to make you work to find its little variants and hidden helpers. This also lends to the replayability of the game, which is just massive. The game isn't just replayable, it begs to be replayed. It wants you to come back time and time again. And in an age where games just slap a new game plus mode on everything, this is a welcome relic from a lost era. A game where the nature of multiple playthroughs was baked into the design, not an afterthought. We sneak into the shipyard, which is just a massive place. It's crawling with soldiers, attack bots, cameras, turrets, anything and everything security. It's a fortress, and infiltrating it can take a while. As Deus Ex nears its conclusions, its missions start to become longer and longer. We aren't exploring the outskirts of the Statue of Liberty anymore, we're lost inside these huge labyrinths of construction, sneaking down alleyways, using anything we can to try and find our way. There are no maps in-game. Well, there are, but they're just pictures. They serve only to give us an idea of where we might be or have to go, but everything else is up to our memory. We eventually board the ship and find out that Captain Zhao was being extorted into working for MJ-12. This is possibly how they exact all of their control over the people that work for them. We have to plant lambs throughout the entire ship, taking it down in a blaze of glory. Afterwards, we head to a mansion and sneak into some catacombs to find Stanton Dowd again. Dowd tells us that Everett was the one originally working on the virus. It was originally meant to help with augmentations, but Bob Page turned it into a weapon. Daedalus wants us to go to Paris as well to find Everett. This is quickened when MJ-12 invades Dowd's estate. We have to escape through the catacombs and head to Paris. Once there, we have to make contact with Silhouette, another supposed terrorist group that has ties to the NSF. The leader wants us to rescue some of his agents who have been captured by MJ-12. Once they're safe, the leader tells us to head to a local club to find Nicolette Duclair. Nicolette is the daughter of Beth Duclair, one of the other members of the Council of Five. Beth was assassinated, but Nicolette might have some idea of where Morgan Everett is. She tells us that MJ-12 were terrified of the Illuminati and killed her mother. She takes us to the Duclair estate to look for clues about Everett's location. Here we can investigate the house, finding keys behind paintings, and eventually getting in contact with Everett himself. Everett first wants us to access a piece of data that's at a nearby Templar cathedral. The Illuminati takes their root in the Templars themselves, their legacy running back hundreds of years. Before we can gather the data, Gunther tries to stop us. He's still loyal to UNATCO and won't see the truth, so it's time to end him. Simmons contacts JC before he leaves. He's not confident the Rebels will be able to synthesize a cure for the Grey Death, mostly because they need a universal constructor, a complicated machine that aids in the creation of a cure. We're finally about to meet Everett, but we're contacted by a strange person named Icarus, then Bob Page himself, who says we're just a prototype. We get taken to Everett's building. Here we can do quite a lot of investigating to find some really interesting stuff. First, we can enter a secret room behind a mirror in his bathroom. This leads us to Lucius De Beers. We find out that he's being kept here, frozen on ice until the technology to revive him comes to fruition. De Beers was the previous head of the Illuminati, and Everett has been using him for advice. We can talk to Everett about this, and he says that he's been keeping De Beers alive solely to help him. He could have revived him years ago. We tell De Beers this, and he's furious, but can't do anything. We can actually shut off his vitals here to put him out of his misery, but Everett gets pretty mad at us. And then there's another secret room we can access with, possibly the definitive moment in Deus Ex. To provide some backstory, Daedalus, the AI that's been communicating with us, was created by MJ-12 to surveil the populace. Daedalus went rogue, and Icarus was created to replace it. 
In the secret room, we find Morpheus, the prototype for all these AI. It's the true moment when JC is faced with the philosophical questions of the situation at hand. This man that has viewed the world in black and white is finally confronted with the true gray. It brings up questions like, what is God? Is God man-made? What is control and surveillance? Do these things have impact? Are they not as they seem? It's an honest conversation, maybe one that JC really isn't ready to have, but one that the player didn't yet know they wanted. This conversation quenches a thirst that we've subconsciously had since the beginning of the game. No one will ever worship a software entity peering at them through a camera. The human organism always worships. First, it was the gods. Then, it was fate, the observation and judgment of others. The sequence was originally meant to provide backstory and give context to the world, but Sheldon Picotti, one of the writers, wanted to use it to tie themes together. There was also originally going to be a text parser that would let you ask questions to Morpheus, but the team felt that the resources weren't there to create something for just one small moment. At this point, Everett needs us to go to the Vandenberg Air Base where we can find Gary Savage, an ex-Area 51 scientist who is working on a universal constructor. This will get us closer to making a cure for the virus. There's something going on with the copter, though. We have the option here of killing the mechanic in Everett's building. Turns out he's a spy and planted a bomb on the plane. If we don't kill him, then Jock will die later in the game. We have to infiltrate Vandenberg and eventually talk to Gary Savage. At this point, Icarus and Daedalus merge into one being, Helios. This is part of Paige's final plan, and he's also captured Savage's daughter. We have to rescue her so that he can keep working on the cure. JC makes his way through the massive sub-base, and eventually finds out that Paige has aimed a warhead at Vandenberg. We quickly have to head over and stop this, re-aiming the warhead at Area 51 itself. We have to head there to stop Paige, who is now trying to join himself with Helios to power himself up and become a being larger than man. Area 51 is the final level of the game. It takes us everywhere over the secret and undercover base. We're attacked by aliens, MJ-12 agents. It's a tour of insanity and hidden conspiracy. Everything is revealed here. At the final stage, we're given a choice. Deus Ex holds three endings behind its final level. We are presented with these three options throughout the level, the powers that be toying with us and pulling us in every direction. Tracer Tong wants us to take down the surveillance system that watches everyone and take the world back into a dark age. This would destroy any sort of control that these organizations have on people, but it would unplug everyone from their universal collective connection. We can also destroy Bob Page and side with Morgan Everett. This will put the Illuminati back in power and leave us at their disposal. This is taking the devil we know over the one we don't, putting us under another thumb, hoping that it's better than the last. The final ending that we can achieve is siding with Helios. We can assimilate with the entity instead of Bob Page. This will turn JC into an all-powerful being, greater than what has come before. Every ending sort of leaves the fate of the world into question. Whether JC would do the right thing with Helios is questionable. He could also be influenced by the AI, causing him to exert worse control than MJ-12. Plunging humanity into a dark age isn't great, but at least they can be free to restart. Though that may just turn into the same cycle that they went through before. Siding with Everett gives another organization control again. We have to hope that they won't make the same mistakes, but we have no idea if they will or not. Any ending is nebulous, but it allows you to make your own assumptions, your own interpretations on what happened. Until the sequel, of course, but we'll get there soon enough. If I had to choose one, I would honestly side with Tracer Tong. I think humanity would be better off building small civilizations again, communities. At least they could try again, restart and make a concerted effort to not make the mistakes of the past. They wouldn't be under the thumb or control of anyone. Deus Ex is a true masterpiece in every sense of the word. I'm not saying that it's a perfect game, but I don't think that games have to be perfect 
to be a masterpiece. The gameplay of Deus Ex allows for so much freedom. As the game progresses, areas open up and they're just so interconnected. So many vents, so many ways to approach. We can hack, pick, sneak, kill, explode our way out or in. It just depends on what we want. But this doesn't just reflect freedom. It reflects respect. The developers truly trusted the players to become a part of the experience. When you play Deus Ex, you aren't just playing a game, you're creating it. Given the creative freedom the game allows you to become a part of its legacy, of its development, the team themselves said they were incredibly surprised with what the players did with things, things they never intended. And in that way, when you play Deus Ex, you become a part of it, assimilated into the Helios AI one with the machine. The story itself is incredibly prophetic and poignant, one that grows more true as the days go by. A good story ages with the world that it's delivered to, and in that regard, Deus Ex is exactly 22 years old. The themes that it deals with, questioning your own existence, what it means to be alive, what it means to be machine, if it even matters in the first place. The themes of control, surveillance, and what it really means to be free in a modern world. It's all just so honest, and it doesn't hold anything back from its audience. In this way, the team also trusts and respects the player. They know that they can handle complex ideas, interesting thoughts that don't need to be spoon-fed to them. The story doesn't wait for you, it expects you to find it. In that regard, the story becomes even more satisfying when we start to piece things together, finding secrets and revealing the true narrative, if there even is one. Can truth even exist in a world like this? The aesthetic itself lives far past the legacy of the game. It permeates the game itself, pushing through the screen to affect the player and deliver another level of immersion almost indescribable with this language. It's truly something to behold, something special and genuine. The design holds no insecurity whatsoever, no ingenuine points, just truth. This is where Deus Ex really shines, if it could even get any brighter. Deus Ex is truly powerful, something amazing. It's an incredible highlight in the history of video games. It's a monument of the past, but also exists on its own today. It's a massive touchstone, one that we should never, ever stop talking about. Because once this game is forgotten, we truly are as doomed as the world Deus Ex presents. Deus Ex sold pretty well in the United States. It had made about $5 million by the end of the year 2000. In Europe, it was even larger, a massive hit. It dominated the charts and would eventually reach gold status. It only reached 1 million sales by 2009, being outsold by its sequel. The game was also critically acclaimed, receiving high praise by most outfits. Most praised its level of freedom and versatility. The team at Ion Storm was ready to start on the second entry in the series, almost immediately following the release of Deus Ex. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.